10 years in the NFL, all 10 years they were with the, uh, were with the Detroit Lions, and um, I, I felt we, we did a pretty good job. We went to the playoffs twice. We won the division one year. That was like in the early 80s. Uh, and then, of course, until the 91 team came around and, and went to the championship, we, we were it. You know? And the time I spent with the Detroit Lions was, was fantastic. It was great. I loved football. Started off as a small kid like most of us did. And for me, it was just be, trying to be part of something. It wasn't so much, I like to hit, but it was about being part of a team. You know, and it was about wearing the equipment because that's a big thing, you know, as a, you get to put the helmet on, the pads, I mean, you know, and it, it looks great. And, and he said how we mimic sometimes the pros, you know, and we watch them on TV. It's about that. Sometimes it's the image and stuff that we get caught into as well. But it's about the teamwork and working together and about, um, I think that was probably the main drive behind that, just being part of something. I went on and um, caught up to my body in, in high school, so I became a starter, had one scholarship um, uh, opportunity, which was Utah State University, and then I got drafted by the Detroit Lions after being ranked sixth in the NCAA with Utah State. All right, um, I'll talk about this in a second, but came to, um, came to Michigan from Utah State. I grew up in Southern California. But what I do now is um, part of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, outreach stuff, but I work at a, uh, after being 12 years at University of Michigan Depression Center, helping develop programs for former athletes. Um, I'm at the Eisenhower Center now, which is a 30-day residential neurocognitive um, uh, treatment facility. And so we get guys, we're behavioral, so we get guys when things have gone wrong. So whether they've uh, hit bottom, whether it's maybe, it might, could be a legal issue, it could be financial, it could be, you know, relationship driven. And of course, this has something to do with it. The brain does. And so based on the experience that I gathered and put it together, um, we receive guys that are pretty much in that collapse form and looking for either, you know, reinvention or they're looking for restoration to back to what they had. And so that's what we do now. And um, so as I go on, you know, I, I, I'll touch on this. You know, we all have a story, and you heard some Scott talking some, or Maurice, but each individual one of our guys has a story, but we also have a common bond, which is the fact that we are in that team makeup, part of the game where we have kind of a hierarchy of command. You know, we, we stick together, and it's not very many people understand what's, you know, those high intensities of, of go up and down, but you know what, we all have stories as well, and our stories are really important because that's how we communicate. And so our story's important, so as I go through mine really quick, just think of your own as well and, and where you are today and how you got there. But as I said, I grew up and ended up uh, at the, uh, uh, being drafted by the Detroit Lions, got my first start, threw four touchdown passes and two touchdowns, I ran them. So that was six touchdowns and that's why it was such a big game. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate that. The, uh, I became a starter after that for the next five, six years and uh, we, like I said, went to division, uh, won the division, went to the playoffs twice. But over that course of time, after going through three head coaches and five offensive coordinators, you know, getting injury is part of the game. We recognize that, and it's all part of it. But sometimes when you have to go in for surgery and have the surgery done, then come back in time to rehab and trying to get your starting job back, it takes a toll. It takes a physical toll, but also takes a mental toll. And that mental toll, psychologically, if you're don't, not aware of it, it starts, can beat you down. And as you try and fight back, you put all your energy into that. And so, and towards my, as I'm going into, uh, I did that three different times, right? Had surgery to where I had to come back and get my starting job back. But towards the end of my career, going into my 10th year, um, I wasn't the same person anymore. You know, physically, I wasn't the same. I couldn't run as fast. Had a severe broken ankle, um, had pins, plates. Couldn't throw the ball as strong because I had a pin in my thumb and uh, three elbow surgeries. But the part that really got me was I wasn't quite the same psychologically. And that was the tough part. You know, I was throwing everything I could into this identity of who I am, and I kind of forgot about the fact that I was married and had two kids, and I just kind of ignored them. Ultimately, that ended up in a divorce, my 10th year coming back in uh, into my 10th season. But that's okay. You know, I had just gone through another injury. I came back, and I got my starting job back. So that's what was important. I got my starting job back, and I got a chance to play against Minnesota. Starting against Minnesota, as I said, I couldn't run as fast. They started blitzing me, and I threw two touchdown passes, but they were both for Minnesota, not for the Detroit. <laughs> so interception for a touchdown, interception for a touchdown. They benched me in the third quarter, and they cut me the next day. 32 years old, what do I do now? This is all I knew. You know, being in that pipeline. Performance, 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 what do I do? I really didn't know what to do. Uh, I kind of searched and kind of took like a year off. Um, I did end up um, getting re-engaged uh, to the, uh, 
a person from Michigan. We've been married 25 years now. And uh, in that process, trying to reinvent yourself, uh, I got into business and I pour myself into that because, you know, football is not an option anymore, obviously. And it was also, also difficult even to watch the games and be associated with it. So I tried to remove myself from it. So just pouring myself into this business, I actually became pretty successful. And it was like six years um, into that business that I was actually making more money than I did when I played football. So I was successful there, but I wasn't successful here. You know, I was still struggling a little bit, masked it with a lot of different things. But as that sixth year, when all of a sudden it hit me, when I just didn't feel the same anymore, I didn't feel right, is the best way to describe it. I just didn't feel good, and I didn't feel right. And in fact, I started wanting not to, uh, to engage and talk to other people. You know, we had uh, two kids at this point in time, and I didn't want to leave the house, you know, and so I, I quit going out and quit calling on people. And in my business, I had, you know, some sales, a, small, a really small sales force, but they can do that for me. I didn't have to. You know, the thing is, over time, you mean not leaving, and me not sometimes even get off the couch. My wife was really worried. You know, she didn't know what to do about it, and I didn't know what it was. It's just, you know, it's just a thing I'm going through. I'll, I'll be fine. Well, it came on a, uh, uh, it was a, a chance to, when the business started falling apart, a chance to kind of re-engage re and, and try and, you know, save the business. Um, I had to fly down to Arizona, and in that process, my wife was really worried about me, and so she was going to drive me to the airport to make sure that, you know, I got there and got there safe and was good and got on the flight. And it was on that trip down to the airport that, um, that I decided I don't want to be here anymore. And it was that process where I just looked over and I wrote a note that said, I'm sorry, I love you, and I handed it to her, and I jumped out of the car. We were going about 75 miles an hour when I jumped out. I hit the pavement. You know, and, and did that number, and it, and it tore me up uh, pretty bad. I don't remember any of that. I just remember waking up in the hospital, and in the hospital, you know, as I woke up, and I had bandages all over me because they did skin grafts, and, and you probably don't remember this because it was a long time ago, but uh, there was a, uh, the paper came out and said, Hipple falls out of car. Didn't say jump because my wife had taken the note and hidden the note. Hipple falls out of car. Psychiatrist sitting next to my bed and starts talking to me about what we can do with Eric. You know, can, you know, we can put him in the, put him in the psychiatric ward and we'll get a good evaluation and figure out what's going on. And when I heard that, I rejected it right out. Because what I remember, right, was uh, the stigma around it. I remember a guy by the name of Mike Tomzak, who was a quarterback for Chicago at the time, was, he went out and he decided to see a psychologist to deal with Coach Ditka. <laughs> and I, I understand that, I do, because I know Coach Ditka. But I couldn't understand why it would be in the paper and why a guy would openly talk about this if that's what he's going to do. In fact, I remember picking up the paper and saying, what a wuss, are you kidding me? What's wrong with, oh, I gotta see a, co I gotta see a psychologist come to the coach? And that's, I made fun of it. So what I heard in my head sitting on that bed when he says, we're gonna do an evaluation on you, uh-uh, that's not me. I don't have a problem. And so I refused it and I got out of the, uh, uh, Got out of the hospital after the bandages came off, and I just I had to tuck it away and go about my business. And, um, and um, it was a, I'm not going to go into the total story. Uh, there's more to it uh, over time. But that was the initial signaling to me that something's wrong. What is this thing? And let's do something about it. So I'm going to backtrack here and just kind of show you kind of, um, you know, what we learned. Because we were actually trying to change the culture, correct? And that's what we're doing. We're trying to change the culture on awareness of the brain, what we can do, how to make the game safer. And in this case, um, I want you to, this is a, a time warp, go back in time, but listen to the announcers, okay, because this is how the game was run at the time. Uh, go ahead and run the video. I'm the quarterback there, so. That penalty has him very close to the goal line. First and 18, and Eric on the rollout. Oh! Eric Hipple. He is bombed by Scott Brantley, and he's hurt. That's always the danger that a professional quarterback faces when he comes on rollout action. Looking from the end zone, Tampa had this played perfectly. You can see that they stayed back, inviting him to run. Pipple had nothing left to do. Watch 52. What contact. That's Scott Brantley, known for his ferocious hitting, and that time he gave a shoulder and a head right to the head of Hipple. Knocked his helmet off. Let's look at that from another angle. 
Hipple trying to get a receiver open, but he sees that he can't. He has to run the ball, but I don't think he saw Brantley coming. Watch this. And look wow, at the Dan. separation of Eric Hipple and his helmet and a good clean shot by Brantley. Sounds a little different, doesn't it? I should have showed that before I went into the seriousness of what happened, I guess, my story. Because it's comical to listen to that now and say a good clean shot by Brantley because that's exactly what we did. I went back in three plays later. That wouldn't happen today. And uh, today, probably Scott Brantley would have been a huge fine. He might have been ejected from the game for a head hit. So the games has changed quite a bit. So we can learn from stuff in the past, right? And we can change the, the future. And, and that's what we're doing. And uh, the fact that you're all here, that's what we're doing. You know, so we're changing the way we look at stuff and the way that we can actually perform and make the game safer. But it's also understanding exactly what's going on with players, with high school students, with college kids as they go through this transitional stuff as well. And so, you know, as I uh, finish up my, my, that piece of my story, um, I ended up going to the University of Michigan Depression Center to get treatment. Okay, and it was um, not only, um, it was treatment for depression, it was treatment for, you know, the, the, the mental health aspect of things, because we still weren't talking about concussions at the time. You know, and so uh, I got involved in suicide prevention, I got involved in, uh, in depression awareness and mental health issues because of those events. And that's where I took off from that point. And so my, excuse me, so my, my, my thinking is that, you know, yes, we learn from the past and apply it to the future, but our stories, the things that happened to us in the past, they, they, don't, they don't shape us. I mean, they shape us, but they don't define us. What defines us is actually what we do with something. So like the lawsuit cases and how some of the people look at what's going on, we're vindictive, we're angry. Well, that's happened. Let's just do something positive about it. So let's bring awareness to it, and that's what we're doing. So it is more about that than money. It's not. It's about making it forward, making the game safer, uh, making injury aware. So... You know, I use the other slide also to show that, you know, what we don't know can hurt us, right? And so knowing what a defense is playing against you is really important. And so that's why we watch film after film after film. That's what we do to prepare for a game. We watch the other teams, how they prepare. I mean, simply how, what they have, what kind of defense they have, what kind of personnel they have. We prepare for it so we are more uh, uh, intelligent on our game planning and we have a better game plan. Well, if that's the truth, if that's what we do for the game, why don't we do that for, you know, something that's even more important, and that's our mental health and our physical health about what goes on with us. And so if we're going to do that and talk about these things, about um, changes in, in behavior and whatnot, we have to look at the brain, of course, because that's where it all comes from. And so to start off with a simple thing, if what we don't know can hurt us, to start with what we do know, you know, the brain's three and, three and a half pounds, 2% of our body, body weight takes 20% of our, our energy throughout the day, that's what we produce, is consumed by the brain. And, and the thing that it does, it's amazing, you know, 100 billion different ions, trillions of connections that form and constantly forming all the time too. It's not just, you know, in this moment in time and it freezes, we continue through brain plasticity, continue to reshape our mind all the time. And so it's keep moving forward is the key in that. But it's about problem solving, because that's what the brain does, and it does it extremely, extremely well. Whether we're awake, whether we're asleep, you know, it's continue, continue uh, problem solving. And in fact, it even shapes our behavior, if you think about it. When we have downtime, what do people like to do? They like to do Sudoku puzzles. They like to do, you know, crossword puzzles. They like to be engaged in something that their mind is occupied in. It's the same thing why kids are so engaged in, in, uh, in video games. It's like one of the purest forms of problem solving because every decision I make has a consequence to it. And so it pulls them in and they're constantly problem solving the whole time through it. And so problem solving drives our behavior. And this is kind of how we think. We have from things we do automatically, I don't have to think about when I throw a football. You know, I pick it up, I just do it. I've done it so many times, I have those pathways that are formed. You know, it's like driving a car. I don't have to think about it, we just do it, right? And it's kind of like, that's how most of the stuff that we do throughout the daytime is, is automatically. We do things automatically because we have pathways that are formed for it. But we have to actually engage in making a decision that has consequence to it, and we have to think about it. We consciously get involved and, and put our involvement there. And if we have to think long term, then we really have to do game planning and think about goal setting. So that's kind of how we think. That's how our brain kind of works in that direction, in that way. The thing is, we've got plenty of problems that we deal with on a daily basis. These are some of them. We deal with these things on a daily basis, right? But we solve them all the time. You know, we solve them daily, we solve them monthly, we solve them yearly, we solve these things all the time. 
Yet, when I hear that somebody dies by suicide, or I have a player, or, or a veteran that's talking about suicide ideation and talking about death, it's because it's not the problem, okay? What you'll hear is, oh man, I just went through a, you know, a divorce. Oh, uh, I just you know, came back from deployment. Oh, I, um, you know, financially, I just lost this, you know? It's not the problem that's the problem, okay? It's the inability to solve the problem. That's the problem. And so if we've got this great problem-solving brain of ours, you know, what are some of the things that happens to us that makes it difficult to solve problems, that our brain has trouble solving those problems? You know, what happens to us? One is injury. And you've talked about the concussion and the brain injury side of it. You know, if you damage that part of your head, it makes it more difficult for it to work, okay? And so we have illness as well, though. And that's also, there's brain illnesses that are out there that we have to be aware of. Things like depression and anxiety and PTSD and, and OCD and ADHD and those things we have to be aware of as well because they have an effect on us. Trauma, experiencing a trauma to where we don't want to experience it again, you know, we actually try to do avoidance and stay away from it because it's painful. The trouble is when we go through a trauma, many times the brain is fragmented, the memories are, because it's trying to protect itself. So it never gets put aside into the other side of the brain that puts it into the drawer in the cabinet with a timestamp on it and says that's where it belongs. It stays up here. And so our avoidance behavior grows and it starts affecting our behavior. And then of course stress, you know, stress we can't get away from. We all have stress. Short-term stress is great. We perform with, with short-term stress. It makes us perform better. But we also have instant feedback on how we're doing. The stress where I worry about the future and I worry about the past doesn't. It keeps us hypervigilant and it actually has, is detrimental to the body and starts breaking us down. Okay, and it affects us in many different ways. And the ways that they, they affect us, well, first of all, let's talk about the injury side. And I know you talked about concussion, but it's a matter of the brain going back and forth and hitting. It doesn't have to be a fractured skull thing. It's just brain injury, right? A concussion. Concussion normally will heal. And you guys talked about this, and I'm sorry I missed the part. But they'll heal at a given time. It's when we hit it again and again and again that it starts to affect us. But there's also the brain illnesses that I discussed. These are them. We need to be aware of what they are because they're all treatable. Concussions are treatable. Okay? And of course, stress. The unknown is probably the most stressful thing you know, to our brain. It likes to be in a stress-free zone to solve problems. If I'm living in a stress-free zone, I can actually you know, be in the moment and think about the problem at hand. The trouble is when we get stressed, it starts coming at us, and all of a sudden we start becoming hypervigilant hyper and trying to protect ourselves, we're not thinking about the actual mo the problem at the moment. And so if you look at these five things, these are the things are that, we're, that can actually keep us in a stress-free zone. Okay, so predictability. We have a schedule. Okay, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. Um, controllability. I am in control. You know, uh, um, it's one of the reasons controllability is so big. It's one of the reasons why, like in disaster areas, right, if there's a uh, relief worker, they'll often go up to kids and say, would you like the the stuff bear or the stuff bunny. They give them a choice because in choosing, it lowers anxiety because now I feel like I'm in control, okay? And by the way, I'll say this, the NFL is very good at this, predictability, the fact that everything is scheduled for us. I mean, we don't go to the, we don't go through the hangar, I mean, excuse me, through the airport to get to the place we're going, we go to the hangar and get on the airplane. When we land, we don't have to go to the, lobby to get our key, our keys are waiting for us, their names on it, they're already checked in, we just pick it up and go. Everything is scheduled, everything is scheduled except for one thing, okay? You have no choice in this stuff except for one thing. On game day, would you like to take the 915 bus or the 945 bus to go to the stadium? They offer a choice because it lowers anxiety. It's something I might not have control over. Well, I don't have control over the weather, I don't have control over you know, the other team, so it lowers my anxiety because I get to make a choice. So it's very, you know, it fits kind of the model. But then relationships, we're built to be in relationships. You know, do I feel safe so I'm in a trusted environment? And then of course, purpose, what am I doing? The reason why I mention this and how powerful this is is because one of the things that players go through or athletes go through or any specific you know, job that has you know, high, high, high intensities to it, uh, like law enforcement and stuff like that, when they're removed from it and they're taken away from it, okay, your identity feels like it's ripped out. And so these transitions are huge. We just uh, surveyed back in 2000, I think it was 2007, and it was with the NFL um, Players Association 
3,000 guys we sent a survey out to, 1,600 of them answered it. And there was different things that were in there, you know, 15% depression rates and stuff like that, and 48% pain rates. But the thing that really stood out was every single player had problems with the transition, every single one. There wasn't one that didn't. So this transition is huge, and it has an effect on us, because when you rip these things out, that moment, they're gone, stress comes into play, and stress can be really detrimental. So the transition is really difficult. And what happens is it shows up in symptoms. These symptoms, like stress out of control, are also the same symptoms of depression. They're also the same symptoms of post-concussive syndrome. And by the way, they're also some of the symptoms from an endocrine dysfunction that might happen from TBI. About 80% of the guys we've had here, we started testing them for their endocrine system. And um, about 80% of them show up deficient in growth hormone, testosterone, and pituitary function. So this is what it looks like. But I'm going to highlight the bottom three, because not only are those things symptoms of these things that are going on, they're also problem-solving tools that the brain will use if it doesn't feel good. And it doesn't know why it doesn't feel good. So if I start feeling crappy, and I don't know why, but all of a sudden I start falling behind, I feel like I'm worthless now, and I'm not feeling as good, I'll try and do something to feel better. And so I'll self-medicate, possibly. You know, I'll find something. You know, a pathway's been driven there before, I'll follow that pathway. Okay, risky behavior, just trying to feel alive again, trying to reenact that, that, those peaks of adrenaline. What do I do? I get in my car and I you know, drive real fast. I get on a motorcycle, drive 120 miles an hour. You know, people that step out on marriages and stuff like that, and relationships, just trying to feel something. Okay. And of course, if I can't fix it, then what happens is the ultimate solution starts popping in the head. You know, if I wasn't around anymore, not only will everybody else be better off, but I don't have to deal with this stuff anymore. And it becomes overwhelming. And so the thoughts of burdensomeness and, and feeling like you're in the way and you're worthless and you're not have, you have no worth anymore, but the only worth that you might find is the fact that maybe your insurance policy will pay off to your family. And they'll be better off without you. And so you don't share that because as a burden, I don't want to bother them anymore. I'm already in the hole. You know, I was here and now I'm here. And so this becomes my problem, my solution starts going to it. And it might just be something that starts off with, with just, you know, one day it's like, I, I can't take this anymore. You know, maybe I've tried the other two for a while. Those aren't working. So, you know, if I just died in my sleep tonight, that would be fine with me. So there's a seed that comes in. The death also becomes an answer. The trouble is, we don't die in our sleep, you know, we're young, and all of a sudden, my mind starts thinking, well, there's a track that's on. You've opened up a door, and now maybe, if I made it look like an accident, you know, if I did it this way, hey, as we had in 2012, some really high cases where guys are actually shooting themselves in the chest, because, you know what, benefit, the other guys will benefit from my brain being examined, so they have a reason for it, and so... That's the track that guys fall down. And most of the guys that we get have had suicide ideation. And I think it's pretty prevalent. One of the reasons why we were asked to come back and put a program together from the NFLPA was because at their conference, the wives were coming up and saying, my husband keeps talking about death. And so they came back together and decided to put a program back together. This is very serious stuff. You know, the thing is though, there's answers for this. There is treatment. Stigma gets in the way. But getting to the answers of this and peeling back the onion, it might be the head injury is influencing more than it should on, on their behavior. It could be just a piece of it. All these are pieces of it. the transition, the brain injury. You know, that's, it's all one big pile that we have to kind, of un, un, uh, to kind of unwind. And so the best way that I found to unwind this thing, first of all, is to say this. Okay. Let's talk about what mental health and mental fitness really is. Okay. It's not the absence of a mental disorder. Okay. That's, it's not that. Okay, it's like um, um, you don't have bipolar illness, so you're healthy. You don't have um, ADHD, so you're healthy. Um, you don't have depression, so you're healthy. It's not. Okay, guys, I know a lot of people that have brain illnesses that are extremely mentally healthy because they're doing what they need to do to take care of themselves. I also know a lot of people that don't have brain illnesses that aren't very healthy, okay, because they're not taking care of themselves. And so it's much more than this. What it is is the sense of well-being. A person has a sense of well-being on who they are, they like who they are, they're comfortable with who they are, they've got their new identity or their identity is intact, okay, and they're able to be productive, they're able to handle normal stresses, and they're able to actually engage and have relationships and be part of a community. That's what true mental health is, and that's what we need to strive for. That's what we're looking for. So when, we, uh, when, when guys come into us and they, it's, it's a very complicated, they just, like I said, they've hit bottom, they know who they are in transition, 
like I said, almost every player will go through this and not know exactly what this is. And so they get categorized. So if I come out and I'm having some trouble, right, and sometimes it, um, the society looks at it, well, you're drinking too much. Okay, put him into an alcohol rehab place because that's what's wrong with him. Okay, you're acting kind of, you know, you know these waves, and these mood changes. You know, he must be bipolar. Let's put him into a psychiatric evaluation and put him over there. They're not really dealing with the true thing, which is this in the middle, which is the fact that getting your head hit over time can have an influence over what's happening, especially if we, if we don't take care of it. But it's not just that in itself. It's combined with other things. The transition of life events, which are tough on anybody, with stress, with trauma. Many of the guys that we uh, end up talking with turn out to have raised in a kind of a traumatic childhood. And in fact, there was a uh, researcher that was in town, this goes back about five years, but I was listening to him talk, and he was talking about post-traumatic stress from combat veterans that come back, and what their fear of sleep, uh, the fossey, the uh, fear, of, fear of sleep inventory was. And their fear of sleep inventory was measured by um, the not wanting to go to sleep. It wasn't the fact that they were, um, what's the word where I can't sleep? Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't what they were insomniacs. It was the opposite. They didn't want to go to sleep because that fear of sleeping and nightmares and night terrors and stuff that were going on, so they fought sleep. Okay. So they're never getting into stage four. They're staying, you know, hypervigilant in stage one, stage two, stage one, stage two. They're never getting down deep sleep. What they decided to do was go into some, some of the um, high crime areas or some of them were inner cities, some of them were rural, but go into some of those areas and start testing some of the kids. And what they found out, the kids that were involved where there's a lot of uh, crime had the same FOSSI score, same fear of sleep inventory that returning veterans from combat did. And it affects growth and affects the way that we feel and that hypervigilance and that trauma stays with them until they get to high school, college, when all of a sudden they're pretty well protected in an environment around sports and performance. They get the pros if they're lucky, they're still surrounded by uh, this protective factor around them that kind of encircles them and gives them predictability and control and, and all, until they leave. And when they leave, they drop off the face of the earth and it's all ripped away. And that skill set to manage some of this stuff isn't there. And so you combine that with head injury, you combine that with the transition piece, you combine that with the pressures and stress that's throwing, and the outcomes can be really, really bad. And so it's addressing this whole picture. And the, I will say, thank goodness and thank uh, for the advances and for this um, spotlight that's been put on head injury for one, is because guys who will not come forward and talk about the issues they're having will identify with head injury. And they'll come out and they'll talk. And they'll open up and they'll start talking about their symptoms and what they're going through. And it gives us a chance to start unfolding that a little bit and saying, okay, that is true. You know, the chances of us having CTE is probably pretty high. Is that affecting you right now? I don't know. But these other things are. And so it can't, gives us a chance to do that. And the more healthy a person is, then the greater the response is to Treatment, the greater the responses to recovery. Pain thresholds um, don't continue to collapse, they, so they feel a little bit better. And then trying to find out the, the true, true meaning or true thing that they're really uh, stuck with. Um, but it starts off with head injury, because they all identify with it. We've all had it. So anyway, um, so I guess my message is, you know, that um, you know, these stories that we talk about and trying to get more people to come forward and trying to advance the medicine so we can answer that question. The faster we can answer the head injury question, the more we're able to answer this other piece of it that goes along with it. And um, so purpose, communication, and support. Uh, this is my family. It's my two daughters up front and my wife in the back. We've gone through quite a bit. We've gone through a lot. Some of it was brought on by uh, transitional issues. Some of it by head injury, I will say. Um, I've been involved in several car accidents as well. Um, and then some of it was also brought on by mental health issues. Um, don't want to throw this on top of the fire, but I will. Uh, I lost a son to suicide when he was age 15. And that is the, the, the part where I co collapsed completely. And the survival through that was with strong support, with communication, with treatment, and pulling that forward. And he had never had a head injury. And so that's the, that piece of it. And it puts me in a really unique position to say, this could be all head injury, or this will be all mental health, but it's not. It's a combination of both. And the more that we learn about one, okay, the more we can identify the other. So that's what I have. So thank you very much. Um, I'll answer questions. So.
Yes. Yeah. For what for this this mission now that what we're doing? Or are you talking about for, as a player? Yeah, there's there's been there's some dramatic significant changes. Um, when I left the game uh, ninety, when I left there was nothing. Okay, when you got cut, you had no insurance. You're kicked out of the thing. You can't go back in. So you lose your doctors. You lose your relationships. You lose your income. You lose your medical support. Um, all in, and your identity all in one day. And that's the stressful piece. The thing is, we are so fragmented, because there's about 18,000 of us, I think, at the time. There's, I think it's 20,000 now former players that are out there. But we're fragmented, because we had nothing to tie into. So everybody would kind of think they're the only one that's doing bad, right? So there was no communication. With social media and the things that started happening, some guys started connecting. You know, there's some sites out there. But really what happened was the, uh, when the head injury thing became to the very forefront, and it looked like it was going to threaten the game, you know, because we have to let, you know, parents know that it is, going, it is safe, you know, so you'll put your kids in, first of all. But also, we better take care of these guys to a certain degree, because otherwise, we're going to have some really bad ambassadors out there that are angry and complaining. And so those two ends of it is kind of what drove the machine to start throwing money at it. And so money was the first research because they want to get behind and see what it is before they, before they say we're going to treat everything. And that's not much different than the DOD. You know, we, let's figure out what we're doing here before we actually do stuff. But they have, they spent, um, for example, the trust, which is part of the NFLPA that shares with the NFL. Uh, the NFLPA is the association, the union, a part of it. But this individual entity called the trust um, does evaluations. They do five-day mind and body evaluations, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, NCU, and Tulane. And between those, they're trying to do evaluations on guys. And uh, they've even moved more into it. They had uh, $200 million in, $220 million for 10 years. So every year they get another $20 million. So um, to, to enact these things out, what they started doing, there was no treatment attached to it. It was just start off um, as let's do the evaluations and collect the data and find out where guys are. But it made guys all of a sudden connecting, but they found out that transition is so huge that they started really focusing on this transitional issue. How do we get guys earlier? How do we get them when they first come out of the game? How do we engage them? And that's, their whole engagement has been about trying to get guys when they first come out of the game. Because if you can fix the transitional issues, then maybe you know, the, the thing that everybody's identifying is all head injury will come down a little bit. And they can actually then be able to say, this is head injury, and this is the transitional issues. And so they've done a really good job at that um, uh, uh, you know, in the last three years. OK? Yeah. yeah. They are. In fact, the funding that we get for um, when we, by the way, we're the only treatment facility that's, uh, that's signed on with, the, um, with the, the trust itself. We started doing work with uh, the NFLPA, the Player Care Foundation, um, that were trying to help guys that were, you know, some of them were homeless, some were, you know, bottomed out, some of them were suicidal. We started doing that, but a lot of it was through a granting process. This is actually the first time of a structure in place that can help support. But they've been paying for some of these guys to come through treatment and trying to help them out. Some of it's financial, trying to get a guy back on their feet again, trying to, you know, uh, where they're at. But and it, and it, when you talk like that, it's like, well, how can that possibly be a guy from up here to be down there? And the NFL doesn't like to talk about that side of it because they still want to have this, this image of everything's cool on top, so you'll play the game. Okay. And, um, and the game is great. All you have to do, though, is just take care of this, this piece of it, and they are. It's starting, it's, starting, it's starting to happen. They still have a long way to go, um, but there are mechanisms there to help guys now. That's yes? Did they follow that long-term, or is it just one evaluation? The actual... There's, there's been so many studies going on that a lot of the players are tired of the research side of it because there's nothing attached to it that would help them. And so now they're starting to realize that we've got to do something for them as well once we do a study. Let's figure out what that means. Or in the research, it has to have a treatment component to it. The, um, right now, the way the trust is set up, for example, um, you have to, I think it's like, you have to have a one, one or two years of, of play uh, on, a, on a team. And then, um, and then when you leave the game, um, you have 15 years within that area. So you get five years worth of health insurance, 
and then you have actually 15 years worth of time that you could actually get, go back into that brain and body evaluation process and come in and get evaluated and see what's wrong. And they do, you know, they do everything. They do heart, they do body, they do you know, brain, they do mental health evaluations. And so they have 15 years. The guys who are 15 years out, there is nothing there still. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are some laws that were passed that, uh, that says, you know, uh, youth coaches, right, Scott, that have to be educated on concussion and have to, so they have to go through a training for concussion. The parents themselves, eh, I, I don't know if there is any program out there yet, other than some of the home ground, um, uh, I think uh, NeuroCore is one of them. It's, uh, I think Dr. Kutcher has like a clinic where he tries to educate people, but yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are, and, and there's also the same um, problem happens with, uh, uh, with mental um, brain illnesses and mental health issues as well, because what is what? You know, what's, what's normal, what's normal? You know, the teenage brain is, is built to be pushing boundaries. You know, it's cutting back, you know, certain connections and reinforcing other connections, so it's going through this, you know, prefrontal, you know, decision-making is not the best there. But for young kids going through that, the, the only thing, I, you know, I, I would say to try and educate, you know, a normal person just talking here, is if you see changes in behavior, okay, then push until you find out what's going on. And so you start with your primary care and say what, what, what this is, what is it not, okay, do I need to take a next step, but keep pushing until you get the answers you have. So, you know, closing off, bright light, you know, not one to engage in people, you know, uh, uh, well, I'm not a doctor, but you know some of those behavioral issues that all of a sudden start standing out because, where it does become a problem, hitting other kids and stuff like that. You know, then then what is going on? But but go after that and don't stop until you get it. But as far as just basic flat out education, there's mental health education that parents don't know about. There's you know brain illness. Yeah. yeah.